This is the Teacher Talking Time Podcast. Before we started the show, we were actually having this conversation about quality and standards of teaching and TEFL programs and all that. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to say that today we have a, a good old friend. Actually, I have a story to, 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 um, to share with you all about guests today, but I'm just going to say his name. <laughs> Ken Lackman is here with us today in the studio. Okay, Ken, how's that- it going? <laughs> Uh, good so far. I, I'm interested to hear what the story is. <laughs> Hi, Michael. Well, it's uh, it's basically a story of like how I came across your work and how we kind of like met. Yeah. So I think it would be a very good way for us to like, introduce you to everyone who is listening to the podcast or maybe even watching video here. But um, I was uh, I had just moved to Toronto, and I think it was my probably my third year in Toronto. And I think you had just started what you call Ken Lackman and Associates. I never met the Associates, but we should talk about the Associates. I think you are one of them. <laughs> <laughs> right. Sounds like a firm. But anyway, I had just moved to Toronto. And I remember there was a, a, a tiny bookstore on St. Clair and called the English Central, which I think it's defunct right now because I drove by the other day. It's still in operation, but uh, she's oper- operating from her home because uh, she doesn't get a lot of walk-in sales. She does. I mean, she's doing very well. Uh, it's online. You know, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, so I was just you know uh, recently had just recently moved to Toronto, and I was feeling a little bit lost because I didn't know anyone in the industry, and I don't I don't know how, but for some reason I came across this uh, bookstore and eventually, you know, I went in, talked to Nicole at the time and she's like, oh, you should come here. Like we have a, we have a a man who does workshops here uh, every once in a while. I'm like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. What's his name? She's like, oh, Ken Lackman. I was like, I've never heard of him. So eventually I decided to join one of the workshops and I think it was one of your first workshops because um, it was on the lexical approach. Yeah. That was early for sure. Yeah. 2007, 2008, which is probably when you started the, the Ken Lackman and Associates. And I remember going to this session and people would just didn't know anything about the lexical approach. And I remember staying, I don't know if you remember this, but I remember staying after the session a little bit to talk to you about the lexical approach. And this is kind of how we we became more acquainted and we started, you know, collaborating and talking more. And eventually you became at one point to me, maybe I never told you this, but you became at one point, you became almost like a, a mentor figure to me because I was mm-hmm. like, Oh, this is a guy who actually knows what he's talking about. And, and I remember oh, when nice. I was here. Yeah. Not always, but most of the time, <laughs> but most, but, but you were someone that actually had a more, I would say a more critical stance towards what happened or was happening in the industry at the time. And I remember feeling like, wow, this is someone that I actually really want to connect. I really want to engage with because you really had something to say. And, and I, and I really like that about you. Mm. So thank you. That's yeah. nice. And so it's all true, I, th- I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> most, I was thinking that maybe we could start by talking a little bit about your teaching background. Like how did you, How did you end up becoming a teacher? Oh, well, uh, it was it was my intention to teach high school because I was in a profession that was very unstable and I was tired of, you know, fluctuations in the economy that constantly found me out of work. So I wanted something stable. So I thought, why not be a teacher? So I went to school to become a, um, a high school teacher, history and art were my teachables, as they call them, but uh, I couldn't get a job. It was 80, no, 95, 95. And they said there were virtually no jobs in Canada. So they suggested that we go overseas, get some teaching experience. I tried international high schools to get something directly related to history or art, couldn't get anything. So I went overseas to teach English. They said, go for a year, two, come back, all the baby boomers will be retiring, there'll be lots of jobs. So I went for a year and stayed for seven because I I just fell in love with teaching English. Um, And one of the things, as you know, um, 
one of the things I love about it is there is nobody knows exactly how to teach. We all have different mm -hmm. ideas and different, and there's all kinds of different ideas about methodology and there's different theories about, um, you know, uh, linguistics and how we learn. Uh, but there's a hundred ways to teach anything. And that's what makes it interesting. It's always trying to find the best way, trying to find a different way. And because my background was in art and I consider myself a creative person, um, this idea of, you know, creating a lesson from nothing and then, you know, creating activities and then doing it and then looking back at what you did and said, well, <laughs> maybe, maybe that wasn't so good. I, I didn't like the part where the students had their heads down, heads down on their desk. I think I need to fix that. <laughs> and, you know, you keep working with things and you come up with better ways of doing things. And of course, by uh, you know, with professional development and sessions like these, you get other ideas and it's just, uh, yeah, this the journey. The journey is exciting because there's always new ideas. As long as you talk to the right people. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And and who are the right people to talk to? Like, who, are, uh, who are, like perhaps maybe like, what, what were your major influences? Like, who are some of the, the thinkers, the, the writers, people that really contributed to Ken Lackman's approach to teaching? Well, other than you, uh, and, and you were, and um, still are an influence. Um, but of course, Michael Lewis. Because when I read the lexical approach, or I read the implementing mm. the lexical approach, it was just, I don't remember how I discovered it. Somebody recommended, and it blew me away. And I thought, this is a completely right. new idea about language, learning, and teaching as you know. Um, yeah. And so he, uh, I mean, Lewis is by far the biggest influence on me. I mean, other people, uh, you know, Dave Willis, of course, with task-based learning, um, and all the the lexical people, you know, Hugh Deller, the other Leo, Leo Sullivan, you right. know, all these people. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and it's great. And we have a little community. And uh, last year at IATEFL, um, most of us met. Um, and we had a little, we went uh, went to the pub and, uh, you know. It, Played it was, scrabbles uh, with, with words there? No. No, no, no. But it was good, you know, trading ideas. That's, that's the best right. part of it. And I think you mentioned that, I remember you telling me this story a long time ago that you became familiar with Lewis through the through this book, implementing the lexical approach, and as you said, it had such an impact on you that you decided to attend the conference in in in. I think you were in Prague at the time, but the conference was ITEFL in Poland, right? Yes. And you heard him speak, and you actually got a chance to talk to him. Is that is that right? Oh yeah, that was tell us an more about that. Yeah, that was an amazing experience. Uh, yeah, I there were there's an ITEFL conference in Poland, and I've been four or five times. Um, but yeah, when I was in Prague, I went, I went three years in succession and yeah, Michael Lewis spoke and I just, you know, I went right, I went right up to him after I was the first one there and I said, I need to talk to you. Uh, and he said, well, I've got this or that something. He said, meet me at, um, his stand because you remember, um, what was the name of his publisher? LTP, company? LTP, LTP. That's right. Yeah. He said, meet me at the LTP stand um later and i yeah. think he gave me an approximate time so i went to the ltp stand he wasn't there but there was some guy named hugh deller right, <laughs> working there so i talked to hugh and he had some really interesting ideas so michael lewis showed up and he took me in a room behind you know behind the publishers area and uh yeah and he and he just asked me what you know what I wanted to ask him, and I said, I, I said, I'm curious because it's all you say. It's all about noticing. It's all about noticing. Mm. It's all receptive, receptive, receptive. I said, where, you know, where does the production take place? And he said, this, I'll never forget this. He said, it's a sign that I have on some British pubs that says "free beer tomorrow," which I think is kind of is that it's kind of the manana concept, right? So in other words, and I thought about that. I thought, what does that mean? I say, you're saying never? We, you never feature production in, in, in the classroom? And he said, if you think about 
you know, the way people learn and, you know, going to, you know, learning history, learning philosophy and, and et cetera, et cetera. He said, there's no production. Mm. And I said, well, that's true. And I, I you know, I, I mean, I was, you know, I was, I had like maybe two or three years teaching experience at this time. So I was kind of intimidated. And Michael Lewis had a reputation of being yes. a little bit aloof. Uh, and I couldn't believe I said, I, I actually, you know, I, uh, I challenged him and mm -hmm. I said, um, well, you know, learning those things aren't, none of those things are nearly as complicated as mm -hmm. learning a language. And he stopped for a second. And I, 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 like, I was in shock because he just turned to me, a, a teacher with two years experience and a terrible training course. Um, he said, you know what? You're right. And that just blew me away. Uh, and I've always felt that you know, noticing, I mean, no, noticing is so is primary, you know, for learning according to the lexical approach people. But I feel that if you if you tell the students you are you you will have to use this language, that's a way to get them to notice. I mean, it makes perfect sense because ultimately, why are you noticing? You're noticing to use it. And Lewis would say that it's all gets stored in there and then it will come out at some point in the future, but why not have it come out right after the noticing takes place? Because, it, you know, what Lewis talks about is in, I'm not sure if this was Lewis or somebody else who said input enhancement is mm -hmm. basically what can you do to the input to make it more readily um, absorbed, you know, right. quite Maybe salient. Absorbed. Yeah. So one of the things I believe you can do um, you know, and it's operating partly on the effective realm is saying, you know, you will have to use this. And you tell that to the students. And then when they listen or they read, they're going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, I know I have to do this task. And that's why it's a good it's a good marriage. I actually, that was what I opened with. I said, you know, I see a, a marriage of task based learning and the lexical approach. And that's what Michael Lewis, another thing he disagreed with, because I thought what you know, what better way than say, you know, you're going to have to do a task. Now look at this text or listen, you know, to these people talking, pick up chunks that you can use when you do the task. Mm. So that was basically our discussion. And I still believe that, you know, that it's, is it's funny. the way to teach. It's funny you say that because in the lexical approach, the 1993 book, he talks about this. I don't know if he calls it a framework. I don't remember exactly, but he calls the OHE framework, which is yes. kind of what you're saying. You observe, you hypothesize, and then you experiment, which to him was an alternative to PPP, which he readily bashed all the time. Because to him, he's like, yeah. PPP, the PPP paradigm is rejected in favor of a, of a better paradigm based on this. I think he called it a cycle where first yes. of all, Learners observe language and use. I think that's the noticing part that you were talking about. And that could be through, you know, listening to or reading a text. After that, they have to make hypotheses about the way the language works. And that could be manipulating those chunks, as you said. Yeah. And then finally, they have to experiment with creating themselves, creating language themselves in their own contexts, right? Yeah, and I'm not sure. Maybe you can answer this question. I'm not sure by experiment if he meant what we consider in the field, you know, um, production or even practice. Right. I mean, experiment I ask, could, yeah. Yeah, yeah, experiment could have been like find five more slot fillers for the semi-fixed right. expression, yeah. which isn't actually putting the students in a you know um, a simulation. Uh, and having them, you know, produce it. So, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I'd have to revisit that to see what he meant by experiment. But certainly uh, that's part of it. Yeah, and, maybe not the same way that Dave Willis meant exploration, right? Like yeah, Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was about to say that, Mike, because I think Dave Willis has a very similar um, cycle for, for that, right? I think it's, mm -hmm. he talks a lot about observing, noticing, but he doesn't call it noticing. Building. System, system building. building and then ex exploration but exploration yeah. is 100 percent production focus yeah. Yeah. right yeah 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 and i think that's what 
maybe maybe the experimenting for Michael Lewis was just this we need to take this longer view um of learning that we cannot expect students to be limited to a very single structure from the beginning of the lesson all the way to the end and presume that this specific grammatical structure has been learned by the end of the class as PPP um proponents advocate right because language learning simply doesn't doesn't work like that yeah interesting yeah. and you said something about about michael lewis you said you you thought that you know the lexical approach and task based language teaching are kind of like the perfect marriage yes can you can you can you tell us more about that well i mean the you know i mean the idea of task based learning is of course um you put the language into, into action you do a task and the task in doing the task it, uh, it involves production and so of course you put the students in a situation um where they have to do a certain task and they are should use language associated with that task um so to me uh and of, uh, and you know in the Willis model, they do uh, talk about using a native like, we'll call it sample, uh, you know, of, you know, let's say competent uh, speakers using the language. Uh, for And from that, the learners can get language to use. I mean, it's got to come from somewhere, right? So to me, it makes sense that you say, here's your task, your task is um, Let's do something simple, giving somebody directions. So right. you listen to somebody, you know, two people, one person gives the other person directions, and the learner ha knows they have to do that task. Um, and so they're going to listen for language to do that task. So, um, and ideally, they're going to be looking for chunks of language, not individual words, and not present perfect structures, I mean, not standard grammar. Now, you know, as you know, Lewis, uh, I mean, Willis, uh, one of the criticisms of Willis was, uh, you know, having the production at the end, um, there's no productive activity, no so productions at the beginning, sorry, um, with the task, and then they're exposed to the language. The idea, is you put them in a situation where they need the language and they're, they're struggling to give directions using whatever language is at their disposable, disposal, and mm -hmm. then you expose them uh, to a native-like sample and they'll say, oh yeah, that's what I needed. Go straight ahead and turn right. Uh, but uh, I'm, you know, what the Willis's maintained, at, you know, at some point, I'm not sure if it was in the first book or later, is that you can add another production stage at the end where it's a little bit more uh well i don't know ideally you wouldn't have to control it ideally the students would just naturally use the chunks that they heard and the chunks that were clarified um so uh and the thing that i like about about doing it that way is each student each learner will pick out different things I mean, so, some of them will be universal, but, uh, and and it's really, it's a very student-centered way. It's like, okay, the student might, one student might know, well, let me go straight ahead and turn right. So that student might not write that down, but that student might, you know, discover something else. And so it's very student-centered. Um, and of course, it's a very descriptive way of looking at structure um, mm -hmm. rather the prescriptive, which is something that PPP was trashed for. <laughs> we will talk about PPP at some point. Mike, you're going to say something? Oh, no, no I was no, going to no, say, no, I think no. that's, that's a basic, right? Which basically um, is to ask language learners to repeat the same or, or a slightly different task at intervals of exam, for example, maybe one or two days or maybe one or yeah. two weeks. And I think the idea in task repetition is that the first performance of the task is regarded as some sort of preparation for future um, performances, right? So ideally, they should be able to use some of that language that they have already used the first time they performed, but this time in different, perhaps different contexts. 
Yes, and, and actually that brings up uh, uh, an interesting uh, idea. Uh, well, it's I, I feel that one of the the biggest issues with the way language is taught um, is this gap between the classroom and the real world, right? Mm. Because and the the way we we teach is just we just keep you know inputting you know, all this language into them and then we expect them just to be able to go out in the real world and use it but this what you're talking about like you know of doing it in stages and ideally there should be you know if there was some way in language you know teaching and learning that you could make the transition gradually through a re repeated mm -hmm. task where they're doing it maybe with their classmates with students from another class um, you know, and they're making this gradual transition to the point where they're using it in the real mm. so-called real world. Yeah. And you you mentioned that this is one of the biggest problems, one of the biggest issues in language teaching, which I think you will agree with me, especially, you know, looking at language courses, language programs in universities and colleges. We're basically hopping on this silly bus and it's just basically horse track English to get to the end and we're just giving students bombarding students with a lot of information and giving them very little time to actually activate practice or even repeat the same task so they can reuse reuse the language right yes exactly um yeah and then ideally it, it, it should be a cumulative thing where you know uh you know for example you do you do a task and you repeat the task but in between the first and second repetition there's been more input um mm. you know and uh, and gradually i mean ideally gradually you're building from you know this the classroom this little isolation box to yeah. the real world you know and, and it's amazing what we don't teach i mean because you know, I had this experience when I went to Cuba and I bought one of these, you know, phrase books. And, and um, you know, this is the criticism of um, uh, what is it, audiolingualism, you know, where you uh, you learn set phrases. Right. And then the problem is, you know, when I went to the hotel, those damn people in the hotel, the hotel receptionist didn't follow the script. And I had no idea what she, what, what she was saying, so I had no Nerve. idea what to respond because they don't follow the script that's in the course books. Terrible. And campaign. this, you know, and we not we we need to teach them. We need to send them these course books and say, when you have, you know, foreigners come to visit, please follow this. Follow the script. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I've been throwing and, this around in my my brain since the beginning. Like, is was it Lewis Ken who said that? That like philosophy and things there's no production or you don't learn like philosophy with production or it's only yeah 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 you know and i th i mean in, in, in theory i guess that that does make sense but like if you think of a university class now i'm having traumatic flashbacks to my my university classes where i was 18 and 19 and you would go to your tutorial for your philosophy class or i did speaking for myself and then the the class leader the ta would say so who did the reading this week? And you know, ninety percent of us would look around, and no one did the reading, right? But then they would ask, you would have. But a you were expecting someone you had <laughs> exactly. But that's the yeah. production in that sense, right? You go to the tutorial and you share yeah. your reflections and you share your. So like, sure, you can learn philosophy on your own online, and there's probably not a lot of production. But like in traditional learning environments, it looks different, but there's still that production, and then the task repetition is like an exam or a midterm exam and then a final exam and all of these kinds of things. So I think that's how learning is. And in language, we need to do the same thing, not in the same mode because it is different, but we there is there is production. If you take a philosophy class, there is production. It is there. For sure. And it's talking about philosophy and then what you've learned. I think you learn more by using your the ideas and by listening to other people use the ideas uh, than you do by reading books uh, because it's it's usage it's interaction it's it's alive and it's you know i i i, I should i'd like to tell this story i'll try to make it short but my second year i think it might have been the same year i saw lewis 
I shared a class with another teacher. They It was the post-secondary program in the Czech Republic. They'd all just finished um, high school and they got one year of free language lessons paid for by the government. So um, they had two teachers, the general English teacher and I was the Cambridge exam teacher, FCE class. This group, they were phenomenal. And the reason they were phenomenal is because they, they were funny, they were flirtatious, uh, there was all kinds of innuendo going on in that room. Anything that I said or somebody else said, somebody commented on, we laughed and we laughed and we laughed. And it was not me who created that. It was the general English teacher, because I didn't know enough about teaching and I didn't see the value in that. But that class academically was the best class I've ever had. They were an FC class. They were so good that almost all of them ended opted up opted for uh, writing the CAE and they all passed. And what I realized is all that innuendo and all the uh, innuendo and all the jokes and that's real communication. You know, asking your partner for things that they have done using the present perfect is not. And this is what I think, this is the problem. We take the real world out of the class. And then we need to somehow, you know, again, it's like joining those two things. We need to bring the world in, the real world into the class or take the students out of the class, you know, one of the two. But, uh, and I, and you know, I had my present class at, and you know where it is, um, where we all were used to work, they took away the participation policy. So I was having a terrible time getting my students to, to speak English. And I just, you know, kept screaming at them, English. And finally I went to management and I, and I told them the problem and I said, okay, take any assessments uh, and change them to uh, participation. And that class is completely different. There's all kinds, because they're fun, they're funny. They were joking in Mandarin before and they were making comments maybe about me. They, they make comments about me to my face, uh, you know, jokes in English. <laughs> and it's completely changed the atmosphere. And, and I'm part of the class other than outsider. And, but, you know, I let that stuff go. I mean, as long as it's not offensive, you know, all the jokes, because that's, that's real communication. You know. I remember when I was, when we were all teaching there, the, I used to joke, but it wasn't a joke. Like, it was real. Like, the most authentic communication was when we went for hot pot at the end of the, end of the semester and everyone was there we were sat For around the sure. table and it was all english and it was fun and laughing and jokes and and it was out in the real world right i don't know if schools <laughs> would just close down and say we're not paying for locations anymore you're going to hot pot on monday you're going to the cafe on tuesday you're going to you know the park on wednesday but there's an idea eliminate your overhead take your students out of the classroom <laughs> uh, i've seen it work i've seen it work where uh, you know, when I was at DOS uh, at EF, I had one student who never went to class. Uh, he was a beginner. And three months later, maybe two months later, he showed up just to, see, he, you know, he decided to come and say hello. And he'd gone from a, basically a zero beginner to, I'd say, intermediate level, like B2. Uh, and I said, Raphael, how did wow. you do that? He said, I've got a girlfriend. He said, that's why I don't need to come to class. <laughs> and I mean, he, I mean, he he just blew past everybody else who had come and registered in the same, you know, in the beginner class. Um, because it's it's real world communication. And that's what it's a different kind of know. business idea, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so so what does that what does that mean for teachers then, Ken, do you think? Like what's our role then? Is our role to be the kind of how do we curate that in our classrooms, do you think? How do we tie in the real world into the daily classroom experience? Uh, that's a, that's an excellent question. I mean, it's, uh, I guess, you know, what what ends up happening in, when I have a good class, um, what happens is we do the, a more or less traditional approach, I you know, uh, with grammar and vocabulary and skills. But in doing that, you know, um, you know, uh, other things happen. 
And like I always, when I when I give it, like today we did conditionals. So if I give a you know a second conditional example, I'll try to make it funny. And what you know what I'm trying to establish is look, anything goes. Uh, make it funny. Uh, you know, uh, and they make jokes about other other students. You know, they'll say, "Well, if Stan was, you know," <laughs> uh, and people laugh. But you know, that's the language that you notice because it means something to you. Uh, it's not just you know, if plus you know, past simple <laughs> plus you know, uh, if plus subject plus past simple. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, absolutely. And I think like that's something that you and I, and I know Leo and I, and, well, all of us really have talked about that this whole idea of building rapport and building the the kind of atmosphere in the classroom is, is not like something you do at the beginning of the term. It's something that is just done on an ongoing basis, right? And these this activity that you mentioned just really speaks to that. But then also, Leo, it kind of brings, ties in like the idea of emotion uh, investment though doesn't it right where like you have to give the students a context that they can really latch on to yeah. right and for ken it's humor or it's going to be something that's connected to their lives and really it's 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 not so much looking at what's in a textbook and, and drawing on that but rather what are some themes some ideas some activities some ways of framing things that really speak to the level of the students both proficiency wise but then also kind of emotionally and socially and right because really if you know what makes them tick teaching is easy <laughs> it's just getting that right yeah. finding out what that is yeah it makes recurrence so much easier too right mike like to take stan's example right if there's a it doesn't have to be humor but if there's a running you know theme throughout your course and then you made a joke about stan because it's funny and then two weeks later when that same you know kind of error comes up probably all you have to say is stan <laughs> remember Stan and then it's a it's a trigger for them right and then they're exactly. associating and they're able to self-correct and it's it's a really powerful tool I, I remember uh, when I first uh, became a, a supervisor uh, when I was in Prague and I was to uh, oversee a group of about 20 teachers and I had to observe them uh, and you know help them with their teaching uh, and I, I saw one-to-one -one class and I still remember the text was about Elton John and it was present simple, Elton John's habits. I still remember he likes donuts. Um, anyway, so <laughs> the students, you know, this is a one to one class. So the student read about Elton John and then the teacher and student talked about Elton John's daily routine, Elton John's habits. And in and, and the book, you know, it was communicating. It was teacher, Elton John, student, student, Elton John, teacher. And when in the feedback, I said, you realize that you had two real people in that room that all that both have routines and habits. And instead <laughs> of communicating direct communicating directly with each other, you were talking about Elton John, which is OK for a while, but then take the book away. And this is something I think that more teachers, every teacher, I think, should do is take the book away and, you know, deal with. You know, as you know, as the dog meat people said, the the textbook is your course book is, are your students and you. Uh, you know. How do you navigate? I don't want to steal oh, oh sorry. Go yeah. Andrew, go, go, go. No, no, I was gonna say, yeah, how do you navigate that? Can you mention the word dogma, which is something that we talk about a lot? You know, when in that moment when we decide to take the book away and then engage with the people there, you know, how how do you navigate that? How do you choose the quote unquote right vocabulary? How do you choose the quote unquote right, at least for that moment, language to to latch on to? Well, I, I did, uh, as you probably know, I did some experiments with that. Uh, I have a teaching method that I developed um, called CAT, uh, and it was conversation activated teaching. And the only reason, you know why I chose the word CAT, right? Because I know. it's, it's obvious. It's a, it's yeah and it's it's a method it, it, it's it's a step-by-step -step method for dog me which is supposed to be anti-method and i remembered when i presented it at iatefl and scott thornberry walked in and i thought oh no because i'd seen dave willis rip somebody apart uh for what he was saying about uh, task-based learning but thornberry loved it in fact he he mentioned it in his session uh, because, you know, I felt dog me was, was overwhelming and is overwhelming for a lot of teachers. So in there with no structure, 
uh, you know, and say, okay, emergent language, let's work with it. So basically what I did is, yeah, I dealt with emergent language, but I reformulated it. So like what I would do is I'd have, I have the students communicating in Paris, for example, talk about your last holiday, um, last vacation. And then, um, I mean, we always chose the topic before every class. It's what the students wanted or needed to talk about. Then I would have the conversation with one student. And I'd say, okay, tell me about your last, uh, your last vacation. And I'd note down what the student said, and then I'd just reformulate it. And, you know, the student, student said, you know, I uh, I took three days in Barcelona. Then I'd say, oh, so you said you spent three days in Barcelona, right? Uh, and the student said, yes. Meanwhile, the other students are noting down these chunks. Then I put them back in their in their groups, in their pairs, and they switch partners. They have the same conversation, but I've got some of the chunks on the board, which they can use if they want. Uh, most of them do. They can select the ones they want. Uh, and then we do it again. And then we just keep building up, you know, um, this collection of chunks that could be used to talk about whatever topic it is. And the students really enjoy it um, because it's very personal and it's um, it's real because they're talking, you know, they're asking each other about their holidays or about how they feel about philosophy or whatever, or that topic actually never gets chosen. <laughs> Donuts. <laughs> I was Donuts. gonna say, because I remember Back in, like, I think the book Teaching Unplugged was published in 2009 or 2010. And around that time, I remember us having a conversation that you had something that you called using the student as input. So, yes. you know, years later, I kind of like remember that. And I was thinking like, maybe there was a lot of, there were a lot of similarities between, you know, using student as input and dogme because dogme is basically focusing on emergent language and the learning yes, language that exactly. emerges comes from the students right so and also you talked a lot about community language learning which you were probably the only person that i've heard ever talking about community language learning and i feel like the student as input dogme elt community language learning they kind of all drink from the same fountain exactly and it was community language learning because I did um, I did a, a, a class on that, a lesson on that for the Delta, uh, and I became fascinated by it because it is taking what the students produce and reformulating it. Uh, and, you know, what I was trying to figure out with, you know, was using it with dogme, but not, not using it in a demand high way where the student says something, oh, teacher, I... Uh, you know, I I did three days in Barcelona, and I say no, no, I spent. Now say it again. Um, you know, I didn't I didn't want that kind of interaction because it's it's not natural. You know, and it's very teacher. I think it's very teacher uh, centered. Um, so uh, I, although I think demand high is uh, has a lot of validity. Um, I think it's you know with all of this, it's just. Working with it, you know, combining different ideas, communicate, you know, a community language learning and dog me and you know, a lexical approach and task based learning and just throwing it all in a blender. No, don't throw it. Uh, but, you know, you, the blender is you, you know, and you say, OK, I'm going to use this from that and that from this. And, you know, they say we're in a post method world. And on one hand, that's that would be great. If people were doing that, if people were saying, you know, OK, I'm going to use this idea from there and that idea from there, I'm going to put it together and create my own method, even if it's a method only for that class. But people aren't doing that. I think the majority of teachers are just saying, well, I don't have to worry about methodology anymore. So I'll just go up and, you know, do whatever. But it, it, fundamentally, what they're doing is, I think, questionable many times because there's no it's not principled. It's exactly. not based on anybody's research or, you know, anybody's uh, researched ideas about how languages are learned or taught. Mm -hmm. It's Absolutely. it's interesting. 
Mike, go for it. No, I, no, I was just gonna say it's something. not it's not principled eclecticism, right? Like it's just yeah. the variety. It's eclecticism. The variety. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I had to mention the buzzword, no. and I also wanted to mention student-centered Kool-Aid because I think that'd be a really cool drink <laughs> that more teachers need to <laughs> swig on. Yeah. It, it's it's funny because I also I'm trying to connect what you said there to a story that you had told me about um, Michael Lewis. We keep going back to Michael Lewis. But everything goes back you know, to Michael Lewis. <laughs> yeah. So we have Michael Lewis with the lexical approach. We have Dave, the Willis is talking about task based language teaching. We have Thornbury with Dogme. We have all these amazing approaches, mindsets, methodologies. And I remember you telling me a story when Michael Lewis started talking to you and he said, I'm pissed off. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. he, this... yeah. And then he, he continued to complain about how he had written the lexical approach. And then years later, Nothing had changed in the classroom. And I think that kind of speaks to the kind of post-methodology um, era that we live in. Um, why? Why has nothing changed? Well, that's, I mean, that was the same conference. It was the first time I saw Michael Lewis, the same conference where I spoke to him. And imagine, you know, I, I'd never been to a conference before. It was my first conference of any kind. And then here I go see this this person who I, I, I admired so much and who I, I, and he opens. This was his opening line. I'm pissed off. I couldn't believe it, but immediately it's I thought, hook. okay, I, yeah. I like this guy, a good hook, yes, I'll tell my <laughs> students that, uh, and I thought, okay, I got to take a talk to this guy, yeah, but that was, that was like uh, 1998, maybe, or seven, um, and yeah, that maybe that moment, maybe I could say that was, you know, when the uh, post-method uh, world started, uh, it was already starting, but uh, yeah, I, I, it's unfortunate. And I don't know, you know, whether Lewis came along too close to the end of methodology. Maybe if all of that stuff had come out five years earlier, it might have had it as a bigger impact. I think part of the problem with the lexical approach, first of all, I mean, part of the problem is always horse books, right? Because it's whatever they can package. Um, and, you know, you can't package, like Lewis said, the average educated native speaker knows it's something like 300,000, approximately 300 to 500,000 lexical chunks. Okay, put that in a course book series. I mean, you can't. So what do they do? They just say, okay, each lesson, we're going to have five collocations. And uh, collocations are great, but it's to me, it was never the meat of the lexical approach. The lexical approach were the other structures, um, you know, especially uh, semi-fixed expressions. Um, you know, because collocations is just, you know, okay, you could, you know, some collocations you can throw them in, but it doesn't give you a structure, a vehicle for for basically mm -hmm. um, using the language. You need structure. And, uh, you know, I mean, traditional grammar teaching doesn't give you that structure unless you want to have a, you know, an entire uh, conversation using just present perfect and, you know, whatever. Let's do it. And, and relative <laughs> pauses. <laughs> your, your hook, Ken, kind of at the beginning of our conversation was that there's not one way to do something and there's many ways to do something. Yeah. And that kind of brings us full circle here a little bit, like. There isn't one way to do something. And maybe that's, I'll take a stab at this as the crux of this, mm -hmm. you know, because there's a bunch of different ways to, to teach, you know, a lot of us choose different ones. And if you work yeah. in any other industry, you know, there are quantifiable ways of measuring improvement, right? Like if you work in sales, then you get five more sales next month and you either did it or you didn't do it, right? If you work in art, you paint five more paintings next month and you didn't, you did it or you didn't do it, right? Right. Whatever method we're we're choosing, like how do you? I think choosing the right method isn't is the wrong question, but like whatever we choose should be to the most benefit of the students that we teach, so they improve. Right. That's my right. Opinion. So how do you, whatever one you're choosing, how do you measure improvement of the students? Well, that's a is an excellent question, and and it's a, of course it's a question we should all be 
asking and trying to answer, but it just reminds me like when I when I was a supervisor of these teachers and basically I was just m m my main aim was to help everybody keep their jobs. Uh, and so what I used to tell them, and I think there's some validity in this, I said, if you want to be successful, make sure your students have fun in the classroom and leave with the feeling that they've learned something because no student will ever complain. And if no student complains, hmm. then you're all set. You'll have a successful career. Um, and I was always leave them with the feeling that they've learned something because we can't tell, <laughs> you know, how do we know that we've learned? And, you know, a lot of, you know, studies have suggested, you know, of course, you know, you teach the present perfect one day and the next day they're not going to produce it. But part of it is there and it will take time before, you know, it, it's like, you know, everything kind of will fit together. And, you know, it's just, uh, uh, and eventually, you know, they'll, I mean, their production will will be very competent and proficient. But, you know, in, and how they get there is an individual thing with every student, you know, so that's another problem. We all learn differently. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. That's a very difficult question to answer. I think the whole industry has been trying to answer that, you know. Because um, those are all words so that we, we use. They want to be more proficient. They want to have more confidence. But even those are not quantifiable. Like, how do you know? How yeah. will you know when you've got more confidence? How will you know when you feel more proficient? Right. I'd, I'd give you eight out of 10 on, for confidence on what you just said. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but there's room for improvement. <laughs> Always. <laughs> But there, therein lies the shortcoming of imperial research, right? Like, yeah. as Ken pointed out, it's more or less about what the student feels and what the, how the student per perceives that value to their lives, right? So if they leave the class feeling like they've learned something and they have a higher sense of self-efficacy, well, you know, that's that's most of it, right? That means that they'll they'll have the confidence to perhaps use what Ken has just taught them in the lesson, in their real worlds, in 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 situ, right? Like, this is. This is essentially it. Like all we have to do is just help them draw attention to where they can perhaps make those connections from what we're doing in the classroom to their real lives. And I think that's what Lewis was talking about. Maybe that's the exploration, right? It's it's um it's helping them think about ways in which what they're encountering in the readings and uh, and the classroom with Ken and the exploration is well, how does that relate to my life, right? Like how will I use that potentially down the road? in a situation and and i think that you know there are lots of studies have shown like you can learn english in many different ways but if you ask a bunch of students what matters most to them oftentimes it's the non-linguistic stuff right like as ken said i love this class because i i uh i feel confident when i leave or or um yeah. i feel more or i i i uh, i'm not as lonely as i used to be because i feel like i can make more friends right like these are the these are the kind of feedback that really kind of make a difference and should make yeah. a difference to the field, not necessarily um, the, the percentile of, of higher test scores or frequency mm -hmm. rates of more academic language and so on. Yeah. It's like linguistic courage, right? Yeah. 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 Self-efficacy, all of that stuff. Yeah. 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 But, you know, for me, one of the things that I always try to foster with students is getting them to laugh at me. I don't mean with me. I mean, laugh at me. And I, Aww. you know, I make spelling mistakes and I, I, I laugh about them. And because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to establish that this, well, I mean, you know what I'm going to say is that in this room, in this environment, there's no such thing as, you know, making a mistake. There's such a thing as experimenting. And yes, I experimented with trying to spell this word and I blew it. Uh, and I actually, I, I reward students, I, uh, you know, when students make mistakes. I, I said, oh, that's great. That's a great mistake. Thank you. Because uh, I'm trying to reverse this nice. whole idea. Because, you know, a lot of students, they're reluctant to try anything new, reluctant to experiment with the language because they're afraid that somebody's going to scold them or or, or embarrass them. Uh, you know, and, you know, I, I mean, I do activities like when I write down what's with, what, you know, errors that students say and, uh, and I have different papers for your students. And I'll hold up the paper that's got the most mistakes and say, this person is keeping, is helping me keep my job. Thank you. 
because you're giving me something to work with in the room. Those the, the people who just use the present simple all the time, you give me nothing. You know, so I'm trying to reverse this whole idea. <laughs> Ouch! That it's it's not about it's not about perfection. It rains, it's, teacher. <laughs> yeah. Well, sometimes it snows. <laughs> sometimes it snows. It's always it's a running joke. When I way back when, when I was actually in a physical yeah. classroom, like I could never, I still can't, like write on the whiteboard and talk at the same time. Impossible. Cannot do it. So I would always enlist students come up and I, they would yeah. write whatever on the board and I would keep talking yeah. and it was just a way to have people involved and they would laugh because I would just make jokes about multitasking and I can't do it and but which is real like it's not a job you really can't I yeah. would always spell it wrong and make a mistake and have to start again and I just said outsourcing it to them but they got involved you know yeah I mean it, it's you want to be on an authority only in your knowledge of the language but you, I mean, I think it's wrong to go in there and and say, okay, I'm the authority in this room, and it's difficult because you're kind of walking this line. You know, you you have classroom management issues, and you don't want them, you know, speaking L1 all the time, and uh, so uh, you're trying. You need to get their respect, uh, but you also you don't want to come across as a policeman. You want to come across as as a friend who's going to say, oh, I can help you say that better, you know, that kind of thing. And I think that's one of the main reasons why a lot of teachers have a hard time letting go of the textbook and relinquishing oh, yeah. control of just like, you know, because dogma, task-based language teaching, um, community language learning, it's basically the teacher is just taking, is almost like a guide on the side. He's not the the sage on the stage, right? He's not the one, as you said, the authority in in the classroom. And I think a lot of teachers have a really hard time just letting go of that role that has been, you know, pretty much prevailing. Uh, yeah, uh, and I think that's a good point also. And I think there is another divide between the methodologists and all these, you know, people like us who are talking, and, and you know, of course, the well-known people in the field, all those names that we've mentioned, and the course books. And I think that's a problem because you have to make a decision as a teacher: Am I going to teach from the course book, or am I going to implement some of these, you know, the ideas that we're talking about? And there's this divide. But I think ideally there sh it shouldn't be there. And what I think is really missing in the field is marrying the two, is training courses to say, okay, we're going to teach you or, or how to approach this course book from a different way. Um, you know, um, maybe for this particular te uh, text, um, we're going to use task-based learning for this test text. I mean, that's really missing, I think. Um, because, you know, most of the training courses, um, like if you do the CELTA, which, I, of course, as a former CELTA trainer, I have a lot of respect for, um, but basically they teach you to te teach from a course book and they kind of more, they talk about other methodologies, but there isn't a lot of training, if any, on, okay, let's take this text and let's do use test teach test with it or use task based learning with it or you come at it through a lexical approach or let's take this lesson and do it dog me style i mean some self the trainers are doing this um but um that's missing i think that's missing and so you have this divide and as i, I can't remember it was michael ranju who said um that you know teachers need to make a choice and most of them will choose the textbook because uh it's easy and it won't get you in trouble. Right? And Ken, I remember you and I had a chat and I don't want to misquote you quoting someone else, but what was yeah. it that you said once about the um, uh, the, the perfect model of a textbook? Because that always stuck with me. Oh, both that was Dave Willis that said that. Uh, was it Dave Scrivener Willis, or Willis? I thought, I thought well, it was Will Scrivener. Willis said it in a session that I saw him deliver at IE Tefl. Whether it was his idea originally or not, I, I don't know. But Willis said, and someone asked him uh, that question, 
And he said his ideal textbook would just be a text, uh, yeah, textbook <laughs> would be a collection of texts. And there'd be a separate book um, giving teachers ideas how to work with those texts. And that's where you could have these other ideas. And I thought it was a great idea. Um, stuff. Yeah, that's always stuck yeah. with me. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think it's because Willis was a huge proponent of building your own corpora, like a corpus yeah. of texts from texts that you use in the classroom and you're constantly revisiting them throughout the, the course, right? You're not just always introducing a new course or a new text um, every week. And uh, since we're talking about the divide, the you know English language teaching, the things that we need, I think it's important for us to talk about the future of English language teaching um, from, from two perspectives. The first one, Ken, and I remember us having this conversation, I think it was a while ago, how we were looking at conferences and we realized that nobody is talking about language anymore. We're not talking about methodology. We're not talking about teaching lexes. We're not talking about any of that. It's rare, especially methodology, isn't it? nobody's working with method methodology. So as far as I know, I mean, the last people I remember doing it were um, uh, Scrivener and Underhill with uh, with uh, Demand High. Uh, but I can't remember anything after that. Yeah, yeah. So nobody's talking about that. And the second thing is AI. I think we need to talk about the future of English language teaching, especially now with AI, because I don't remember where I read this or someone said it, so I'm paraphrasing it badly here. But this this person said that AI will happen to education, not by education. And it's very much integrated yeah. in into all the technology that, that we use and we will use. So the real question for many of us is how many teaching roles it will replace, not people but roles. So I wanted to get your, your opinion on this. Like, what do you think is the future of English language teaching now, especially knowing that we have AI, chat GPT, Google Bard now? So what are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, um, there will always be jobs at private language schools because that's about the experience. Um, that's about being 19 years old or 20 years old, and we all know about this, right? And going to, you know, somewhere you've never been before, meeting people from other countries and partying and making connections and, you know, all kinds of things, you know, happen. And that's an amazing experience. Um, and that will always be there. Uh, but for those students, you know, it's, it's not only it's not only language learning. It's also communicating with other, you know, other mostly young people, uh, and just the cultural experience. Um, so those, I mean, those might be the last job standing, uh, and uh, that would make sense. Uh, you know, I think we were Leo and I, you, you and I, we were talking about this before. Um, I see as much as I think we're all we all have we're all we all have our hesitations about AI. It's going to level the playing field in terms of the quality of instruction. And that's something that's a huge problem in our industry. You know, we all know mm -hmm. uh, that there are huge differences from one school to the next, one teacher to the next, one course book to the next. Uh, and and I feel sorry for the students because I've seen classes that they've put up with and they put up with them, you know, and if you ask them, sometimes they'll say, well, this is the same. This is not that different from how I learned at home, you know, in my own country. So um, and uh, they usually don't complain. Uh, but there's such a huge gulf between, you know, th those teachers that are really, really trying to, you know, to, to be effective language teachers and those who are just going through the motions. And, of course, you know, page turners, as I call them, in the course book. Uh, and AI can, can fix that. AI can, you know, I mean, uh, every student, every learner everywhere in the world can have access the same high quality of language teaching with AI. Yeah. I The way I see it, 
And I was thinking about this yesterday because I was having a conversation with someone about AI. And I think that a lot of people are very hesitant. A lot of teachers, people in colleges and universities, they're very, very against the use of AI. But I can really see AI helping teachers. It's going to help them with, I honestly think, all the time-consuming stuff, which is planning, researching ideas for a lesson, even marking, coming up with different types of assessment. And I think because we're freeing up so much time with all this consuming stuff, I think it will allow teachers to focus more on what really matters, which is the students, right? The learning. And I think it could really do wonders for the profession, as you said. And I think it's really going to um, even things out. And I think, as you said, a lot of people are actually using AI to learn languages, but they still need the interaction. They still need those jokes in the classroom, right? They still need that social aspect yeah. of, of language that AI cannot provide, right? Yeah, that's a very good point. And uh, um, I mean, one of the, the great things about AI is you want to text on a particular subject, um, five seconds sometimes. Uh, and I remember in uh, in the dog me book, uh, they were talking about, you know, of course, you know, the lessons come from the learner uh, and, uh, and what students want to talk about depends on who they are and where they are. And there was a, we talked about a class in Poland where they wanted to talk about the second world war. You want to text on the second world war? Well, an aspect of how it affected this town in Poland, it's there in seconds. Uh, and that's the beauty of it. Uh, I mean, I don't know if you've seen Joga Conga's video um, that she posted. Um, it's on Facebook. Um, how she used AI to prepare materials for her class. She wanted role plays where the students were going to practice present perfect. So she basically told, uh, I think it was chat GPT, uh, I need role plays. I need these structures in the role play. And I need them to be this long, and I need you know six different characters, seconds, role play. I mean, they, they were like cards, you know, and wow. uh, that's amazing. And it was you know geared towards you know the, uh, whatever uh, topic the students were interested in. So in terms of producing texts and other materials, I mean, what a great way to tailor it to your students' needs. Just tool, write a text right? just like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I always say this like what lessons versus learning a language. Like 99% of a student's language learning journey is when they're not with their teacher, right? So yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It's another <laughs> tool for them. Like if if your goal for your student is to leave the class and be able to do X, like implement that strategy when they are reading that book that they're reading or they're watching the movie that they're watching, why wouldn't AI be any different? Like be able to use that when you leave the class, use that same strategy to tell chat gtp to to do that thing and then they can read the text on the thing that they want i mean it's a it's wonderful if it's used like any tool not good or bad but if used properly it's a it's great wonderful. source of input right it's just a great source of input yeah yeah well, i would love to see chat uh um, chat gpt or any of these ai pros what i'd love to see them do is kill homework <laughs> I'd love to see the end of homework because homework is, be, is it, I mean, or assignments, it, it's going to become pointless anyways. I mean, I spend all this time paraphrase, teaching the students how to paraphrase. I've noticed now when I give them paraphrasing homework, it's perfect because chat GPT did it, you know, <laughs> I mean, and what's the point? What's the point? What's the point of learning how to paraphrase when you can ask G chat GPT to do it for you? Um, it's an interesting question about the plagiarism discussion or or whatever oh yeah. <laughs> about how that that's a different conversation but like how is that what that turns into as well yeah i don't know but you know i, I mean it's just you know when you're typing the, the what they call predictive text where it finishes the sentence for you well that's that's kind of a low level ai isn't it i mean and yeah uh, all the students are, have access to that. All learners have access to that. Um, I don't know. It, it's a big problem. Uh, I, I mean, think... you could do that in class. I, I learned that from you, both of you, all three of you, actually, about like manual predictive text where you would just say 
the first two words of a sentence or write it on the board and then the students have to finish it in the million different ways that you could possibly yeah, but yeah. you could just put google on your screen right and just do the same thing and then they have to like yeah. you know and that's a tool that they can predictive tasks is a really nice Lexical. But th this is, Activity. I think, this is going to be one of the biggest challenges I think the industry has ever faced. Because we had challenges before, you know, it's like, you know, phones. And, and there were lots of sessions uh, at conferences, how to use, how to, you know, use phones in the language classroom, you know. Um, and now it's, and that's nothing. I mean, you know, you know, whatever uh, adaptations, uh, we're done with, you know, emerging technology in the past is nothing as compared to what's going to or what should happen next. And it's like, how do we work with AI? Um, and I think we, we need to completely rethink language teaching yeah. and, and communication. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I've said for years, you know, uh, learners were not, languages were not meant to be learned by students sitting at desks you know, doing exercises. But, uh, you know, I thought students need to move around. They, they need to talk to each other in pairs and groups, you know, all of that. But now it's like, where does, you know, me, where does 80% of my communication take place? Me sitting at a desk like we're doing now. And this is where, this is, this is how we communicate now and most of, of most of my communication is written communication in text yeah. messages and and, uh, Leo and, you and I, yeah yeah we communicate like that all the time yeah. so yeah. we we need to rethink what communication is um and we need to th rethink what students need to know and yeah. you know what um priorities um, have changed yeah Sugata Mitra says in his talk, um, oh, he asked the question, have we made knowing obsolete? Do you really need to know anymore? Do you need to know how to write a grammatically correct sentence? Or can you just say to chat GPT, please write me an academic paragraph about, you know, please write me a letter of apology to you know my doctor for missing the appointment yeah. and it's there but even right. with chat tpt i think we still have to educate students on how to properly use the tool because again then we have a little bit of digital literacy right because yeah. if you just go into chat tpt and you ask chat tpt to write an essay for you it's going to write a really bad essay like a really bad essay because you need to think about like what do i want what do i need to write in an essay i've noticed that about chat gpt it generates fake citations you know it generates fake citations it's really good at that so that's amazing um, yeah and i think it also changed the dynamic it's changing the dynamic in the classroom and i'll never forget um, when Thornbury talked about dogma for the first time, he said that instead of taking the scenic route, which was teacher, course book, course book, student, student, yeah. course book, course book, back to teacher. Now we have a third element. We have the AI teacher. So it's the teacher communicating to the learner and the teacher communicating to the AI teacher. And then we have the learner communicating to the AI teacher and the learner communicating with the AI learner. Right, so there's there's a lot there's a lot happening there, right? So, oh, but but I think with essays, I think it's possible. Uh, I mean, because what you have to do, and it is it's learning a new skill. Chat GPT yes. or any of these programs will give you a paragraph. Then you have to go back and say that's not exactly what I want. Like I don't know if you saw my Facebook. I think you did see my Facebook post. I needed a text on the Russian Ark that movie, and so I asked Chat GPT. Chat GPT to write me something. And I said, no, I need to know the number of rooms they went through. And I need to know, uh, I think, how many, I can't remember how, to, uh, how many actors. And, and I kept going back and said, okay, I need to know this, I need to know that. So you're actually working with it and, and guiding it to produce the exact text that you want, whether it's uh, you know an article or whether it's an essay. And yeah. in the future, there will be people, whether they're students or whoever, who will be very good at getting chat GPT 
working with it, refining it. That and that requires a lot of critical thinking. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't require any knowledge of the language. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I think it's there's a, a lot to be version of the same. You know, there will always be people who are interested in learning something and people who are interested in just getting by. And that's yeah. exists now that has always existed and that will continue to exist. So, I mean, that's, you know, it's a tool that can be used in many ways, good and bad. And you're not going to probably change. I remember we had a unit where we taught about robots or something. And yes. there was a question about, you know, robot teachers and I'd always ask, like, do you think a robot teacher? And they always giggled and laughed and said, no, 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 human teachers are always better. I wonder what they would say now if we asked, if I asked mm -hmm. them again. But I think like this goes back to humanistic stuff and, and motivation and, and what is someone's motives for doing something. If they actually want to learn something, they can use AI to help them along that way. Yeah. But certainly it's not, they're not going to be satisfied probably with, with the whole thing. And if people just want to say, hey, I just need to pass this test so I can do this thing. Then that's a different kind of motivation that that already exists. Yeah. So it but it's funny that we're forgetting we're mm -hmm. forgetting about one of the most revolutionary educational tools ever invented. That when it first came out, people freaked out. Can you guys know? Yeah. Do you guys know what it was? <laughs> the blackboard. I was gonna say chalk. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> when the when the blackboard first came out, people were just upset. They were upset. They're like, well, we're not going to use a blackboard. This is insane. But it had an enormous impact on classroom efficiency. It was mm -hmm. simple. It was effective. It was an economy, ease of use. And of course, we had its cousin, yeah. the whiteboard. And then we have its its second, deg second degree cousin, which is the, the whiteboard, which apparently disappeared. Uh, I guess it's not it's not around I anymore. I think it has, no. actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's well, it's yeah. human nature, right, to resist change. Like, if you go back far enough, like, people didn't want electricity, they didn't want cars because their horses were fine, you know, like every, yeah. every new thing, you know, has, a, has its own. And Ken, you said the right thing, I think, at least in my opinion, like if you're asking the question, how can we stop students from using AI? That's the wrong question. Cause that's not going to happen. So embracing it, yeah. incorporating it, seeing the benefits from it and back to task-based learning. Cause the question isn't language 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 is what is the student want to do what is the yeah. thing that they want to do and how can we help them to do it i think one of the things that we could we can perhaps teach our students is evaluating right so this is what i was talking about when when i was getting it to write that text for me i'd read it and say no it's not what i want I mean, it's partly what I want. So getting the students, I mean, if you told the student, for example, okay, you need a text that you will need to uh, give to your eight-year-old sister or whatever. So they'll have to ask their own vocabulary to hard, you know. They'll yeah. have to actually work with, with, with the program to get it to produce a, a certain text. So some knowledge of language will be important. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's an, a very it's a it's a strange, brave new world or scary new world. I don't know. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. As we wrap it up, I just have one final question. This is a question that I like asking. I haven't had a chance to ask this question because we haven't had interviews in a little while. But Ken, if you could have a gigantic billboard anywhere, anything written on it, metaphorically speaking, of course, getting a message to millions billions of people out there what would it say and why about language learning anything um, i don't know I, I mean listen to the learner just immediately comes to mind just because it kind of sounds like it's a bit catchy um but i think it is important i think it's important i can't tell you how many observations i did in the past of teachers when i said I said, didn't you notice that the students were sitting there <laughs> staring down through portions of your class? I, I mean, you know, as a teacher, you need to try to get inside the heads and, and you know, and, and the hearts and to some degree of your learners. And that's key, I think. So, and, and that goes for not just, um, yeah, if you guys remember that uh, TED talk about the, the magician, right? Look, being able to look at, Oh yeah. Look at from somebody else's perspective. And that's what I put on the billboard. It's not just about language learning. It's about connecting with people, right? Making connections. So put yourself 
the ability to put yourself in somebody else's position and see how they see and understand. That's my billboard. Beautiful. <laughs> yes, that's very nice. Well, that'd can... be an expensive billboard. It's a lot of words, but that's a really, it's a good one. I, I, I can get chat GPT to reduce it. <laughs> <laughs> Can you summarize that into like one or two sentences? Yes. Yes. Make it entertaining, engaging, fun, educational. Yes. Uh, well, Ken, thanks a lot for uh, for joining us. It's it's been yeah, a it was... pleasure talking, and uh, yeah, we we're gonna be releasing this episode very soon. And uh, yeah, thanks everyone for listening. And as usual, don't forget to subscribe to Teacher Talking Time podcast on any of your uh, podcast players or don't forget to actually have a chance to watch this on youtube so thanks everyone for for listening and for watching and we'll see you um next time